Did you watch Beat the Streets this past weekend? It was such a phenomenal lineup of wrestling events in New York City. This week, I'm talking all about Yanni beating the number one ranked wrestler in the world, the Ben Askren versus Jordan Burroughs match, the Rutgers wrestling lineup in 2019-2020, and seven more wrestling rules you can expect next season. So without further ado, let's stop stalling and start talking wrestling. Hello everybody, my name is Josiah and welcome to the Fanka Wrestling Show where I talk all about the latest news and everything going on in college wrestling, high school wrestling, and just the wrestling community. And if you are a fan and want to join this wrestling community, make sure you hit subscribe and like this video so I can keep making more videos like this because it's so fun to start the conversation and discuss it with you guys in the comments below. And this past weekend was so fun because of Beat the Streets. If you weren't there, well hopefully you watched it on Facebook flow wrestling just like i did i wasn't at the event but let's get right into today's topic so what was the best match of beat the streets well i actually asked you guys on my channel what you thought the best match was of beat the streets and the four options that i had were jojo aragona versus adam buscello uh which you guys had at four percent nick Suriano versus joe cologne at 11 percent ben Askren versus jordan bros 19 percent of you voted that that was the best match that was actually the marquee match of the night but the overwhelming response was yanni d versus bajang punia at 67 percent that was the best match of the night and i have to agree yanni is a freak okay let's let's just stop and think about this yanni is a freak he's a sophomore in college gra going to be graduating at uh as a true sophomore and he just beat the number one ranked wrestler in the world in punia what are you kidding me so so, so let's look at this matchup first of all that was the best match of the night, mostly because it was so exciting to see because both guys were going back and forth. Like, Punia wasn't just putting up with Yanni. You know, Yanni goes out here and he texts guys like it's nothing. And and we saw a couple of those matches throughout the night where guys were just getting tacked in the first period uh, and, and beat up pretty bad or pinned. And, and don't get me wrong, there were some great matches. But this match, there was a lot of back and forth where Yanni was up big, then Punia was coming back a little bit, but Yanni stayed out on top. And it was so cool to see. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with with who this is, who Yanni was wrestling, the number one ranked wrestler in the world. Let me read off a couple of his accomplishments. So he was the 2018 world silver medalist, the 2013 world bronze medalist at 60 kilograms. In 2017, he was U23 world silver medalist, and he won the Asian Games. He won gold in 2018. In 2014, at the same games, he won 2014, he won a silver medal. This guy's not anything to joke around with, and he's, he's a grown man. And Yanni just came out here, beat him 10 to 8. What a match. So why do I say Yanni's a freak? Well, you know, hopefully you know a little bit about Yanni, but if you don't, or maybe let's just look back at Yanni's accomplishments. Okay. So Yanni, first of all, he's a two-time national champion, two-time finalist, two-time national champion as a true sophomore. Last year he won it as a true freshman. Uh, same with Spencer Lee. And this year he won it again. He beat Dom Demas. He also beat uh, Ironman and McKenna. Yanni has one loss in college. One loss comes from Ironman. S Ironman. Since he beat Ironman, or since he lost to Ironman, he beat him three times since then. Three times since then. He he's beat. Now it's, it's been close matches, but like really, Yanni just turns it on. Now what else? You know. If maybe you guys don't know if if you're new to college wrestling this year yanni won as a true freshman with a torn acl a torn acl i'm telling you this kid's a freak and let's not also forget about over the last couple weeks what's happened is that yanni won the u.s open so yanni didn't just win the u.s open he dominated the u.s open he beat frank molinero who is a returning uh world medalist uh, or Olympian, I'm sorry. He, he's an Olympian, placed fifth. Uh, he teched Jordan Oliver, who was last year's U.S. Open champion, which that was probably the highlight of the U.S. Open this year was uh, Yanni teching him. And then, and then in the finals, Yanni wrestled Zane Rutherford, who, as a Penn State guy, I'm always going to cheer on Zane, but 
Yanni came out there and beat him. Now, it was a close match, and I could see that going back and forth a couple of times with these guys, but really, Yanni showed that he deserved to be the U.S. champion, uh, U.S. Open champion this year, so he earned a spot at Final X, and I'll be getting into that in a little bit about Final X and talking about that topic. However, you know, let's look at what Yanni said too, which is, I, I think, just such a perfect summary of who Yanni Giacomo is of Cornell. He said in an Instagram post, he's too young. He's not strong enough. He's not on that level yet. I'm here. I'm ready. I have three words for you guys. Don't doubt Yanni. So let's move on to the next topic of the day. Who won Beat the Streets? Was it Team USA or was it the returning national finalists? So this is a topic. I mean, really, there's no winner or loser here. You know, it's it Beat the Streets isn't like a competition where you have one team against another, but there's a theme this year. And that theme this year was Team USA versus national finalists, national champions. Uh, and I thought it'd be fun to take a look at like, who actually won this year in in those matches? So there were four big matches where it was a member of the U.S. Res USA Wrestling team, current USA Wrestling team versus uh, this past year, 2018 2019 national champion. So first up, we had James Green versus Anthony Ashnault, and James Green, uh, of course, he won that match. He is. He was the runner-up at the U.S. Open. He's a guy from New Jersey, just like Anthony Ashnault, who is New Jersey's first ever four times undefeated state champion and four-time All-American. He was on a great Rutgers team this year. He, he and Nick Suriano both won national titles, and first time in Rutgers history. But Ashnault just couldn't pull it out. He lost that 8-4. to four. So that's one for Team USA with James Green. Next up, we had Nick Wazdowski versus Derek White. And this was a pretty solid match. I mean, between these two heavyweight guys, uh, I, I thought it was... It was quite swell. Now, Gwizdowski, he was a he's a world bronze medalist, whereas Derek White this past year, he was in the national finals. He lost to Anthony Kassar, if you remember that. Uh, Kassar pulled it out big time. But Derek White came in, wrestled, beat the streets, and he ended up losing. He lost 9-0 to zero to Nick. And so that's two. USA 2 uh, and national finalist zero so far but let's not get ahead of ourselves because nick suriano versus joe cologne what a match what a year for suriano i, I like i don't want to say that i doubted suriano coming into this but joe cologne just beat the number one ranked wrestler in the world uh, a couple weeks ago at pan ams and he i mean he's a great wrestler usa world or uh, world team member and he was a world bronze medalist and now Suriano coming in. He hasn't wrestled freestyle since like 2014. And he comes in and he wins. I was surprised by that. Let me know in the comments below if you were surprised by that. Uh, or if you're a big Suriano supporter and you thought that was great. What a year for this kid. I mean, Suriano, he had a couple of losses throughout the season. Then he comes back. He has a great Big Ten tournament. A great national tournament. And now he has a great postseason. He just keeps on winning. And he'll be back again next year. So that's one for the national finalists. And that means we have one more matchup. And that was Drew Foster versus David Taylor. Now... Okay, Drew Foster, he was the national champion this year. He ended up injuring David Taylor, which that was just terrible to see. It was about, I don't know, 30 seconds into the match. And we see that these guys in a scramble, uh, they're, Drew Foster's kind of has Taylor's knee. He's taken it. He's kind of cranking a little bit. I, I don't think he meant to do it intentionally in a bad way at all. Um, but he ended up twisting David Taylor's knee and he hurt taylor came back up he tried to wrestle it actually the he had the medic tape it up which just looked you know pretty uncomfortable but he comes out there and uh, you know even the head of beat the streets he the, the runner he came up and he said like look david you don't have to do this you, you shouldn't do this like this is just for advantage for charity you know you don't have to risk your whole career on this match right here. And, and David Taylor, you know, the sportsman that he is, he wants to give the fans a good show. But he came back in there again and just could not continue. He ended up, you know, forfeiting to Drew Foster. I, I think really David Taylor would have ended up winning that match pretty big. Uh, however, you know, 
Technically, Drew Foster won that, so that is two for Team USA and two for the national finalists. So, actually, a pretty solid showing. Uh, you know, if David Taylor wasn't injured, I think it would have been three to one, but I, I thought that was pretty interesting. And there's another notable match with Team USA versus NCAA. And it, although he was a national finalist, uh, Brucky actually wrestled uh, Cox. So, Jaden Cox. Uh, world champ, Pan Am champ, ranked number one in the world right now at 92 kilograms. And Brucky is a national semifinalist. Uh, he actually lost to Bo Nickel. He got pinned. I think he would have made the finals if he wasn't pinned by Bo, but he ended up did, he ended up taking fourth at nationals. And you know that was another great match. Although he wasn't a finalist, I'm not counting him in this competition. But Cox, you know, he handled him pretty well. Let's get on to the last match of Beat the Streets. So the showstopper, the sh best match at Beat the Streets, uh, maybe not the best match, but the biggest match was Ben Askren versus Jordan Burroughs. So this was a very hyped up match. You know, you have a guy coming in from US UFC who is a national champion, and then you have a guy who is another national champion, Olympic champion, world champion, and Jordan Burroughs. Two guys who are like the epitome, the best at the top at each of their sports. They're coming in and they're wrestling each other at a charity event, beat the streets. So did this live up to the hype? Well, you know, I, I think it, it did. It was a little bit of a, I don't want to say it was a letdown, but the thing is, you know, with Burroughs and Askren and you know freestyle it was it was a quick match compared to the match before that Yanni versus Punia which was you know a little bit more exciting because it was actually a whole match you had Burroughs and Askren where Burroughs really just took it to him all right Burroughs blast doubled Askren into another dimension it was absolutely wild and I think that this match was so hyped up uh because these guys were they were jabbing each other on Twitter and social media for a few weeks, a few months, and they were just trying to, you know, I wondered how much of that was real uh, because, you know, Askren is a showman, and I know that he has that angry side to him, but he's also, he's a really nice guy, and so is Burroughs. I mean, I can't really see Burroughs trash talking that much uh, in real life, but in on social media, it really leveled up the event. And, you know, as soon as you get out there, you see Askren whispering something to Burroughs, and he just said, uh, in the interview after, he said, he whispered to Burroughs, like, can you believe we're out here wrestling at Madison Square Garden right now at Beat the Streets? Like, come on. And Burroughs really didn't give him any response, um, but he just kept wrestling because in Burroughs' post-match interview, he said, look, I'm out here to do this for my family. I can't let up, not even for a second, because Askren asked him, like, he's like, I thought you were taking it easy on me. But yeah, he ended up picking him up and blast double on Askren because I asked you guys, actually, on my channel, I said, what do you think is most likely to happen? And I said, what what happens most likely? Will Askren funk Jordan Burroughs? Will Jordan Burroughs blast double Askren? Will JB pin Askren? Or will Askren attempt to fight JB? And and I didn't think that last one would happen at all. Uh, but you guys all said that JB would blast Askren into another dimension, and that's exactly what happened. It was really a fun match, and I think it grew the speed sport uh it, it got people that were interested in ufc interested in wrestling a little bit i think and you see that with dana white who now uh you know him and Askren have had a big you know feud going on over the last couple of years because Askren wanted to fight ufc well now he's there and now white is saying who is a leader of the ufc he's saying that burroughs he wants him to fight in the UFC. And as you know, you know, him and Burroughs and Shale had that little jabs at each other a couple weeks ago. And I really don't know if Burroughs should fight UFC. Maybe when he's done wrestling. But right now, he's doing so well in wrestling. Why does he want to risk his face, you know, and, and, get, and get beat up like that? So that was a pretty awesome match. Let me know what you guys thought in the comments below. Did this live up to the hype? And I want to get on to the next topic. So a big question that I'm always asked that I've been asked a couple times is what is the process to qualify for Final X and actually qualify for the world team, make a world team? So let's get into this and talk about there are three ways that you can make it to Final X, which is the process to make the world team on USA Wrestling. So how do we determine the senior world team? Well, 
This is right now final act. If you aren't sure what it is, it's it, uh, it's in its second year only. So you know you're not crazy if you don't know exactly what it is. Last year they had three events to qualify for the world teams. This year they're down to two. They're in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, home of Jordan Burroughs, you know, college. And then there's also one in Rutgers, which they've had a great year this year. And, you know, New Jersey is a big wrestling state. They may do really well this year at Final X. So there are 10 weights uh, in men's freestyle, women's freestyle, and Greco-Roman. So that means there are 30 total weights. Well, these weights are divided up, split right in half, and 15 uh, of each are at each of these locations. So you have men's freestyle, women's freestyle, and Greco-Roman. So what are the roads to Final X? How do you get there? Well, there are three ways, like I said. The first way is the most straightforward way, not the easiest way, but the most straightforward, is if you were a returning world team, a world medalist, then you get a buy right to the finals of Final X. So we're talking guys like Kyle Dake, like David Taylor, uh, like Kyle Snyder, Jaden Cox, Jordan Burroughs. These guys are all in the final, sitting in the final of Final X. Okay, so that's straightforward. The second way is at the U.S. Open. So that was an event that happened a couple weeks ago. U.S. Open, if you win the U.S. Open and there is not a returning world medalist at that weight so like i said at david taylor's weight that's not a thing however at 65 kilograms where you have guys like zane rutherford uh, jordan oliver and yanni whoever wins the u.s open in this case it was yanni he gets a buy straight to the finals of final x now if there is if somebody wins the u.s open but there is a returning world medalist that means that 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 winner of the U.S. Open gets a bye to the finals of the World Team Trials, which is the next step in this process. So, third step, third way that you can qualify for Final X is if you win the World Team Trials, then that that is the second guy, essentially, who gets to wrestle in Final X. So you have your world team medalist at, you know, David Taylor's weight or Kyle Dake's weight. You have them. They're sitting in the finals. Now there has to be another guy to wrestle him for, to see who makes a world team. Well, it's either the one of the U.S. Open uh, moves on to the world team trials. The world team trials tournament happens this year. It's in Raleigh uh, in a couple weeks. And that champion goes on to wrestle in Final X. So three ways. Uh, and, and let me explain a little bit about Final X, too. So, you know, hopefully that wasn't too difficult to understand. Um, I, I understand that it can be a little bit confusing at first, but those are the three ways. So Final X now, there's a best of three format. So that means, you know, you win two matches out of three, you're in. One, one, one. That, that's how it works. There are 15 weights, like I said, per uh, event. So Nebraska and Rutgers. And in, just to give you a couple guys who may be wrestling at each of these events. So at Rutgers, there's Yanni, uh, who is the U.S. Open champion. You've Kyle Dake, who won world uh, won Worlds last year. David Taylor, also a world champion. Jaden Cox, uh, world champion. And Nick Wisdowski, who, who placed bronze at Worlds. Then in Nebraska, you have Dayton Fix, the U.S. Open champion. Joe Colon took bronze last year, uh, who's... Just beat by Nick Suriano, but uh, uh, beat the streets, but that's, that's how it works. Jordan Burroughs uh, took bronze last year. Kyle Snyder took second, and Sarah Hildebrandt took second at World. So those are all those are all wrestlers wrestling in Final X. So the other thing that makes things kind of interesting this year is, you know, it's an Olympic year next year. So a lot of these wrestlers are looking to medal this year because what happens is Every wrestler who medals at an Olympic weight, there's six of them uh, out of the 10 of the world weights. There's six Olympic weights. And everybody who medals at Worlds this year will qualify that weight at the for the Olympics next year. So if you know Kyle Dake medals this year, which I think he will, he'll qualify that weight. So there are you know six of those. And then 
uh, whoever wins, whoever medals, has an automatic buy next year into the Olympic trials for the U.S. So that's hopefully not too confusing, and that's how you qualify for Final X. It's a pretty exciting process, and I can't wait to watch. So the next topic I want to talk about, what is Rutgers' lineup going to look like next year? 2019-2020, what is Rutgers going to look like? They just graduated Anthony Ashnall, which was very unfortunate because that is a guy who wrestled extremely well this year. He's a four-time national finalist, and he is a national champion, obviously, this year. A Rutgers second national champion, only behind Nick Suriano, who is returning. Now, Rutgers has four out of the top 100 recruits in the class of 2019, and they have one of those guys, one in the top 10. It's pretty good. You know, only nine other schools can say that. Actually, less than that because Ohio State has three in the top 10. However, this is about Rucker. So, big year, but they're graduating Ashnall, John Van Brill, and Nick Gravina. Um, now, I also want to say that by Rutgers, which is another reason I, I want to talk about Rutgers this week, is because they had a great performance at Beat the Streets. I mean, you talk about Nick Suriano beating Joey Colon. You talk about Jojo Aragona beating Adam Buscello, uh, pinning him. And then even Anthony Ashnall had a solid match with James Green. But let's get into the lineup. I'm going to go right down through 125 all the way to heavyweight. First up at 125, uh, we have a guy, Shane Metzler, who is returning, and he, you know, he is a true junior, so he could take a redshirt year. I really don't know why he would, um, but he is a guy who went 10 and 18 last season. He struggled a little bit, but, you know, he's their 125 pounder, and I don't see any competition here. There really aren't that many you know, backups here that will be starting over him. So I see Metzler at 125. At 133, you know, you got Nick Suriano. And Suriano isn't a guy who's going to get beat out by anybody on his team. Uh, he's a returning national champion, two-time national finalist. He was a Big Ten champ. And, you know, he's coming off of, like I said, that big win off of Beat the Streets. And he's just on top of the world right now, Nick Suriano, as he deserves to be. Uh, he's he struggled in the past, and by struggle, I mean just mean he's he's gone through some hardships, not necessarily in his wrestling career, uh, but he did have a couple losses that he ended up avenging in Michich, in uh, DeSanto. He ended up avenging those losses uh, and beating Fix in the national finals. I see Suriano starting again at 133 as a true senior. So, Next up at 141 pounds, we have uh, we have a couple guys who could make the lineup. Uh, last year's starting was Peter LaPerry. Peter LaPerry is 13 and 14. He was a national qualifier, so that's pretty good, and that actually helped uh, Rutgers do really well at the national tournament. They ended up finishing ninth place with like 50 some points, just I believe behind Minnesota, who again had another great great tournament. Now LaPerry won a match in Pittsburgh, which. It's more than a lot of guys can say, and he, you know, he wrestled really well. He'll be going up against another guy who is Jojo Aragona. Now, Aragona coming in as a true freshman, uh, he just graduated. He's actually he hasn't even graduated high school yet, but he's coming in. I uh, wrestled well at Beat the Streets. He is the number six recruit in the country right now. He is number one at 138 pounds. He is a state champ from New Jersey. And he, like I say, pinned Buscello, who is going to Arizona State. And he, he won Beast of the East, which is a massive high school tournament. Now, Aragona, I think, you know, he could wrestle 41. He could wrestle 49. Uh, he wrestled 38 in high school, so I probably see that 41. But will he wrestle this next year? I don't think so. Uh, I haven't really heard anything. I, I don't really think that he'll wrestle as a true freshman. Might as well take that redshirt year. Uh, but, you know, it could happen. But that's just because of that IP LaPerry uh, starting at 141 for Rutgers this year. Next up, 149. Again, you have Aragona, like I said, but I, I don't think he's going to start. Then you have you have a couple guys. This is actually a pretty loaded weight for Rutgers. They have Nick, you have Nick Santos, who is a redshirt sophomore. He was injured last year. He went 20-8. and eight. Um and then in his true freshman season, uh, that's when he went 28. Next up, you have Mike Van Brill, who is a junior, who wrestled 141 last year, wrestled against Peter Perry, uh, but ended up outgrowing that weight. So you have Brill there. And then 
you have uh, Devin Britton. Uh, Devon Britton, sorry, he was a true freshman. Devon is the number 83 recruit, so that's another one of their top 100 recruits, class of 2019. And he's actually a guy who's not from New Jersey. He is a two-time state place winner from Pennsylvania. And why do I point that out, that he's not from New Jersey? Well, look, Rutgers has so many New Jersey guys in their lineup. And last year, every single guy who started was from New Jersey. And look, there's something to say about that in that they wrestled well with all New Jersey guys. However, and this is just my opinion, you need guys from all over the, the country to make a solid team, okay? You need guys from Pennsylvania, from Virginia, from California, from Texas, from Iowa, from all over the country to make up a good team. Now, you're not always going to get those guys. You know, you're not going to get a... 50 guys on your team for in your lineup and i'm not saying you have to the best guy who who wrestles you know it makes a team that's who needs to wrestle whether they're from doesn't matter where they're from but i think Rutgers needs to look a little bit at recruiting and you know they did that this year with devon Britton coming in from pa so you know that's just my side but mike van bro i believe that he's going to start you know he's a junior he's going to start at 149 pounds at 157 you have another recruit coming in at number 66 recruit is robert Kennard, who is a true freshman will be a true freshman don't see much competition there at 157 uh because john van brill who was a national qualifier actually graduated and you know you have that boom boom tough graduations in national at 149 and then van brill at 57 you know those are tough losses that uh, Rutgers is going to have to make up for in some way at 165 pounds another loaded weight you've canard who could go up and wrestle but i see him dropping down wrestling 57 uh you've stefan glasgow who's a true sophomore who wrestled you know his first season this past year as a freshman or was his first big 10 tournament didn't qualify for nationals but you know he, he had a decent season uh he was seven in nine and then again another guy you have is anthony oliveri who is a junior right now who i see making this way is steph uh, glasgow i see him wrestling at 165 pounds for Rutgers. at 174 you have jackson turley who is a the fourth recruit from uh, Rutgers in the top 100, number 45 recruit in the country, graduating 2019, and he's another guy not from New Jersey, so he's from Virginia. However, I don't think he's going to start this year. I actually think Joe Grello, who's a redshirt junior, is going to start. He was a national qualifier last year, went 18 and 11, and he wrestled well at Midland. Uh, he and he actually won two matches in Pittsburgh, so. He wrestled well, and I see Grello starting again, and that way Turley can actually take that redshirt year. At 197, two guys here, Matt Carrenti, who's a redshirt junior, and Max Wright. So Eminem, uh, Matt and Max. Max Wright is a sophomore. He is he was actually injured uh, in last year, and he stepped in in the last match last couple of matches uh, and then the other guy Carenti Carenti was a national qualifier in 2017 and also a big 10 place winner in 2017 uh, and that's why I think he's going to start again this year at as a redshirt junior at 197 pounds and Christian Colucci at heavyweight is going to wrestle as a redshirt senior he transferred from Lehigh uh, last year he wrestled for Rutgers, 15 and 13 he was, and he almost qualified for nationals. So Rutgers, I don't know if they're going to do as well as they did last year, just because they have a couple guys, you know, missing now. However, I think they could have a decent season, win a couple of duels, and I think they mostly just have a couple of great guys who uh, can contend for a national title. You know, maybe Aragona wrestles, it, and he, you know, is a all-american and i think suriana again is in contention for that national title and that's what i have to say about Rutgers. what a great upcoming season they may have and last week last couple weeks ago we talked about rule changes coming into next wrestling season well now there are seven more potential rule changes coming in the 2019-2020 season and the last time we talked we talked about the headgear rule uh whether guys have to actually should wear headgear the other rules we talked about were of course 
uh, the third party review and whether that should be a thing, whether there should be a third party ref who isn't on the mat reviewing. But now there are seven more rules coming out. This came out from a, a national NCAA press conference, press release, and they said, um, they said we're open we're opening up to be more progressive in the sport. This should give everyone more freedom of expression and hopefully make the sport more inclusive. We have our eye on the future with the thought that this could help the sport grow. Now that sounds like a really political answer. I mean, let's be honest. Let's be more inclusive. Let's get everybody in. Very political answer. But let's actually examine what these rules are. So let's go through these seven rules. The first one is shorts in wrestling so wrestlers with this new rule they'd be allowed to wear uh loose fitting shorts in a tight shirt so that's that like two-piece wrestling uh uniform as opposed to a singlet now let me know what you think about that uniform it's been becoming a little bit bigger uh you see guys wrestle like this at flow wrestling who's number one uh and i actually saw my my alma mater high school uh wrestled in these the last couple seasons they got rid of their singlets and end up wrestling in shorts and tight shirts i have to say i'm not a big fan of it um if guys want to wrestle like that sure you know it it brings the argument is that it brings guys into the sport who don't want to wrestle in a singlet like football players who may think they're too tough or whatever for a singlet which I don't know how many of those guys are out there and how much that actually impacts their decision, but that's one of the rules. The next rule, hair. So right now, as the rules stand, the current rule is that the hair cannot extend below uh, your shirt collar and it cannot cover your earlobes. It has to be free of oils. Uh, you can't wrestle with facial hair, uh, just like me, but you cannot have extremely long hair. Now, this is, I think, becoming a little bit bigger, and this is where the inclusivity comes in is because if girls are wrestling, you know, should they be allowed to wrestle with the long hair? You see, you saw the girls wrestle like that at Beat the Streets, you know, with their long hair. Now, should guys be allowed to wrestle like that? Sure. I mean, as long as it's not you're not pulling on it, it, that's, it doesn't really bother me that much. The next up is the video review. Now, this, I thought, was one of the most uh, intriguing rule changes that they're coming up with. And, and these rules right now are not set in stone. They're not 100% going to happen. There's the NCAA committee going to talk about these on June 13th. Now, this rule has to do with challenging. And this, you know, looking at you a little bit, John Smith, but... If there is an unsuccessful coach's challenge on the mat, this would result in a stalling warning for the wrestler if they lose the challenge. So if John Smith challenges Dayton Fix's takedown and it is ruled no good, that means that Dayton Fix would then be hit with a stalling warning. And if he already has another stalling warning, that will stack and he will be deducted or he will the other wrestler will be awarded a point i think this is pretty good you know why because there are too many unnecessary challenges like let's just throw the brick to see to see if we can get anything or let's just throw the brick at the end of the match and it just it holds things up a little bit and and look right now you can't blame the coaches because that's the rule and if they have the brick throw it you know you can't really blame them however this could result in some very uh more Tact, uh, t greater tactics upcoming. Now, next up is another cool rule that I kind of like is medical forfeits. This has been an issue over the last couple of years, uh, particularly this year. You may remember when Shakur Rashid medically forfeited to Miles Martin in the Big Ten Finals, and this caused quite a stir up, rightfully so. However, you also have guys like Stefan Micic who medically forfeited because he was actually injured. Last year, you had Jason Nolf did the same thing. Uh, but, you know, people are wondering, like, should people be punished for this? Well, now a new rule that the committee wants to talk about is, yeah, you would be punished. This would actually be a loss on your record. So this would help a lot with seeding at nationals. And I think a lot, you know, a lot of times... It did hurt some guys, but it didn't hurt others. And I think if they add this as a definite loss, it would be 
great for seeding. However, I think the other side you have to look at is it's not necessarily, it shouldn't necessarily be a win for the other guy. So like if Pletcher and Michich are wrestling and Michich, you know, he medically forfeits, he can't wrestle, uh, Pletcher shouldn't necessarily get that win because I don't know if Pletcher can beat Michich or, you know, if, if Michich is wrestling just some, some, you know, no name wrestler, should that guy get a win over Michich if he had some medical forfeit? I don't know. But it, going into conference championships, that I think is pretty big. The next rule is weigh-ins. Uh, you know, quick rule. Just The current rule is guys weigh in an hour before their matches, up to an hour before, sometimes even closer to match time as far as dual meets go. This would allow up to two hours before four weigh-ins. I think that's good, mostly because, you know, guys weigh in, you get your, uh, you know, practice session in and warm up in before the duel. I think that's a pretty good rule. And then the next rule is stalling warning. So right now, uh, and this is, the rule here is just increasing the points uh, for consecutive stalling warnings. Right now, what happens is you're given a warning, then one point, then one point, then one point, then one point on your fifth, uh, and then you are disqualified from the match. And this new rule on your fifth uh, stalling warning, you'd be deducted two points, or the other wrestler would be given two points, and then you'd be TQ'd. So it's just another point. And then as far as hands to the face, which is the... Uh, another rule change is that hands to the face right now is an unnecessary roughness call, which means that, you know, if there is unnecessary roughness, other guys given a point right away. And this was a huge, annoying problem this year it happened and screwed up a lot of guys, uh, took a couple matches away from guys and everybody's been harping at how horrible this rule is. Uh, and now what the committee wants to do is change it from an unnecessary roughness to what is called a um, illegal hold. So the illegal hold is mostly refs. They need they want to prevent that from happening, and they'll kind of give you a warning. They'll call it off before they're actually deducting a point. And those are the seven rules that may be changing this upcoming season. The final topic of the day. Let's talk about Zion Clark. Do you guys know who Zion is? Do you know who Zion is? Well, Zion was recently on the Ellen DeGeneres show this past week, and that's why I'm talking about this. I thought Zion is a great inspirational wrestler, and I love to talk about these inspiring wrestling stories on the Fanco Wrestling Show because these show guys that, you know, maybe they have a little bit of a handicap or they, you know, can't do as well as other guys, you know, on the surface. However, these are inspiring guys that push the limit. And they show everybody else that, yes, I can do that too. And that's just what Zion did. So if you see from my thumbnail, you may know Zion Clark is actually, he was born without legs. This is a disease called caudal regression syndrome. And one out of 100,000 kids every year gets this. Uh, and, you know, he was born without legs, unfortunately. But when he was around seven or eight years old, uh, he, he had a coach, he had somebody come to him and say, you know, you should think about wrestling. And, you know, a lot of people would think that's laughable because how are you going to wrestle without legs? Uh, well, I'll give you one example is one guy who won a national title without one leg is Anthony Robles, uh, who beat Matt McDonough for a national title some years ago and is actually a commentator and a lot of the national, at the national finals level right now. But Zion born without legs, wrestled seven, uh, started when he was seven and eight, and he's from Ohio. So all you Ohio wrestlers out there, this is for you. Uh, he wrestled at Massillon High School, and he just graduated wrestling in college now, actually, which is pretty exciting at Kent State Branch Campus. Now, what was really exciting, I think where a lot of this inspiration comes in, is that you know Zion had a tough life as a child. Uh, he was beat his mom was on drugs and and you know just a little bit into the story from what i understand it's it, it was tough but wrestling gave back to him and you know it showed him that he can be better than all of that and, and i don't want to speak for zion i'm just i'm just saying you know from what i've understood from him and 
his senior year in high school, you know, he he won matches in high school before, but his senior year, he came in and he won 18 straight matches, was undefeated, 18 straight matches, and then he ended his season 33 and 15 and qualifying for the state tournament in Ohio. What a feat for Zion. You know, I, I gotta clap my hands for him. Phenomenal. Then he went on to wrestle in college. He wasn't done there. He went on to wrestle in college. He wrestled his freshman year. Uh, D1 at NCWA. So not the NCAA because uh, Kent State, uh, what's their name? T- Kent State Tuscaraguas. That's the, that's the crazy name. Uh, of course, Kent State is a D1 school, but this branch campus is a NCWA school. He wrestled 125 pounds and he is built upper body and you know he has that little bit of an advantage because he can be built upper body although he doesn't have any legs you know that can be seen as an advantage and disadvantage um on the wrestling mat you know how are you going to take him down if he doesn't have legs uh but you know zion found a way around it on his end and he was great on ellen it's always great to see wrestlers on these talk shows on you know make it big in the news for good stories. Not like that story from a few months ago when the one wrestler had to, the ref made him shave his hair off. You know, that's wrestling making bad headlines. This is wrestling making good headlines. And if you guys want to check it out, there's actually a documentary on Zion on Netflix right now. It's very short. It's like 11 minutes long or something. I watched it. came out like last summer and it just details his story a little bit. I really recommend that you guys check that out. And one of the big goals Zion wants to do is he wants to wrestle in the Olympics and the Paralympics uh, as well as in track. And, you know, good for him. I think it's good that he's setting goals high and Congrats to Zion for a phenomenal career thus far. And guys, make sure that you leave your comments below and let me know what you want to see on the next Fanco Wrestling Show. There's a lot of great stuff coming up in the upcoming weeks. Next week, something to look forward to. If you made it to the end of this video, make sure you leave a thumbs up emoji and tell me what you're excited for in next week's videos, which are all about D1 wrestler, D2 wrestler, D3 wrestlers, in how they chose the college that they are wrestling at now or that they graduated from. I think it's a very difficult decision for you if you're in high school now to make and maybe you're a coach now and you want to help these uh, youth wrestlers out and make their college decision. I have great advice from these guys coming up next week and make sure as always you check out these other wrestling news and videos because there's so much more to come and guys thanks for watching.